Your support helps us bring you programs you love. Go to wyomingpbs.org, click on support, and become a sustaining member or an annual member. It's easy and secure. Thank you. <laughs> oh, it's, it's a hobby that got out of control, really. We're the nerds in our own little right, so this is our playground. It's definitely more of a passion job. If you don't love beer, there's no reason to work your butt off in there. Everyone and their dog was having breweries, wineries, distilleries, but nobody was making mead. It's a waste of time and it's way too expensive. You know, the whole town knew that tree, and even the owner of the tree said, oh, I can't stand those, those apples. We think that those are one of the best cider apples we've ever found. Now we're producing a product that is an inherent form of taking advantage of those lesser valuable, less beautiful apples. It's kind of a big, multi-dimensional, non-linear optimization problem. <laughs> Cider, mead, and beer on this Farm to Fork, Wyoming. Funding for this program was provided by the members of the Wyoming PBS Foundation. Thank you for your support. I come from a winemaking background and wasn't enthralled by the winemaking culture and moved back to Wyoming. I just saw the crab apples growing everywhere and realized that there's so much flavor packed in those fruits and there may be an opportunity to make cider in a way that you don't normally make. It's cool to kind of breathe life into these varieties that are neglected and forgotten and, and um, not respected because people don't realize that they were for a different purpose. People worry about things around the ground, but birds get in the trees and do their work and take one little bite out of a huge apple, and that thing is, would otherwise be ruined. But for us, that's something that is part of the whole process. I mean, we try and sort out some of the more uh, obscene looking fruit. So much good stuff out there to be had. It's just not gonna be used. I am the repossessor of the world. Orion has a little bit of that too. We harvest apples from all over, all sorts of different environments, different settings. This one is one of the more wild ones with the trees having um, so much age, they, they really can be intense to harvest and to work with. And then with animals on the ground underneath, everything from sheep to deer to even bears have come in here. Things that live in the natural world make it in there. Yellow jackets fly in there while we're fermenting. Um, so you get any number of things in there. And that's the whole reason for fermentation in many ways. Is it's food preservation and it's also food pasteurization before we knew about pasteurizing. It's a sterilization through alcohol and through the fermentation process and large amounts of CO2. Cider in America is actually a really interesting subject while we're sitting in this orchard because, you know, cider was a really big common beverage to be found all over the frontier and all over America. But then, you know, prohibition had a big impact on the cider producing orchards of the United States, particularly the ones that grew apples that were specific for hard cider. There was really no excuse to keep those trees around during prohibition. Entire orchards had to go because those apples were never desirable to eat fresh. They needed to be fermented in order to, to be more palatable. And this orchard seems to have missed a lot of the impacts that prohibition had on orchards around the US. And so there's a lot of varieties here. Like not only are these trees 130 years old, thereabouts, and have been living in this harsh climate all that time, 
which is amazing enough for us, but it's also really cool how many of them are delicious to eat fresh, but many are delicious to ferment with and, and only when fermented. So a lot of the cider makers around the country don't have access to apples like this because they were all lost and then those orchards turned into dessert apple production for the grocery stores and things. You know, 100 years ago, you'd try a cider and it was almost certainly gonna be sweet unless uh, it was a scrumpy or something. They called them farmhouse scrumpies. And that was something that you could just ferment in the farmhouse and have around. Those were usually dry. But the reason ciders were so sweet back then was because if you could make a cider sweet, it meant you understood the science and process of fermentation so well that you could control it you could control the yeast to the point where they would only ferment part of the sugar and then their populations would die out and you'd leave a little sugar left. Nowadays, you can kind of just sprinkle in some sulfur or any kind of preservative right when the cider's tasting how you might want it and it's done. And so the sweetness no longer represents the craft. We're trying to make ciders that are dry but also express the apple nuance, but more than anything, express the, the fact that we can grow apples in this area. That's sort of what we're after the most. The coolest thing for me about that fact is that we can promote, as a cider company, we can promote apple diversity. Getting people to realize that that diversity is a really important part of sustainability in general, um, blending apples with lots of different varieties to make a, a diverse cider, but also to have a lot of varieties that will produce in different years when there's a frost early, then you have some late blooming trees that will still produce. And it's that insurance policy that diversity gives you in an agricultural setting. There's a lot of varieties that come in in August and uh, a bunch come in, you know, the majority come in in September and then October is where you're rolling the dice on frost. This year is an example of an orchard with a portion of the, or of the trees being late ripening trees. And uh, we had a cold couple nights that got down to 10 degrees, froze the apples and changed their chemical composition by allowing the waters in the apple to evaporate out, therefore concentrating the sugars in the remaining juice of the apple. Instead of being bummed that we had a frost. We have to embrace the fact that it's gonna frost here. It's going to do, uh, it's probably gonna frost harder earlier and more unpredictably as time goes on. Instead of being sad that the apples have been frozen and they're not like what we are used to working with, we have always read about for years ice ciders from other cold weather climates and letting the apples freeze on purpose in order to concentrate the sugars concentrate the flavor and produce a, a different style of cider that people want more. Who knows? We'll find out. My family had kind of been through a tough time with my dad was trying to figure out how to, how to pay the bills. He's very good at instigating projects, and but he's like, huh, oh, I have a barn, and I could put a brewery in there. <laughs> and so Dad did the typical thing of begging his friends and family for money, and, and so he ordered the system in early 2013. The guy stopped returning our phone calls. <laughs> the fabricator was crying and said that he was going out of business, and his guys had all left him, and his... His wife was divorcing him and his partners were suing him. And so I said, uh, who cares, where's, you know, where's, my, where's my stuff? In 10 sleep, if you're not open in the summer, you're, you're in for a rough time. So we were sitting here in early September having missed the whole summer with a bunch of smashed up steel out in the dirt. And that's, that was my introduction to, to brewing in Wyoming. Did our first brew on October 2nd. 2013, that kind of lit the fire and it's been pretty solid growth. We shoved the last fermenter we could possibly shove in there last year. 
Today, Ten Sleep Brewery is a cultural intersection. For six months out of the year, winter time, we're selling beer to locals, and they have a, you know, they drink a ton of Speed Goat. <laughs> um, you know, kind of Wyoming drinkers want lighter beers. Um, and then we have a summer demographic that's rock climbers and travelers going from uh, the Black Hills to Yellowstone or the other way around. And so those guys are drinking him dry from IPAs. Yeah, we can't, we're so, brewing IPAs back to back basically to just to keep up. Two completely different taste demographics. Community kind of happened pretty naturally here. And it's, it's super cool to see those groups interacting. We'll have half the house is locals and like, you know, old school ranchers and everybody you see around here all year long. And then the other half of the house is climbers and, and travelers world. from all over. Yeah, I guess that maybe is uh, part of the really great thing about this industry is that you're making something people like and creating a place where they want to hang out. The brewing culture today lends itself well to experimentation and collaboration. It's, it's really interesting to me seeing we've had two um, fairly recent, more professional brewers who have had a typical professional brewing path. I've been out in Ten Sleep all summer since June, and I came here to brew beer and to rock climb. <laughs> Working with Alexa this summer, we learned a bunch of things that we're trying to implement going forward. I was super into craft beer from the age of 21. I got a finance degree and decided I didn't want to go that traditional route um, or any sort of desk job. Here I am, nine years later, loving it. You know, there's a bunch of science and then there's beer at the end. So It's pretty much perfect for engineers because there's an artistic side that we may not get to scratch as much as we'd like. It's kind of a big, multi-dimensional, non-linear optimization problem. <laughs> So I, get to, engineer. so I get to nerd out on that a little yeah. bit. Six years into production, Tensley Brewery now features a number of special recipes. Starting from this end, this is, uh, this is Speed Goat. This is our flagship beer. We make, <laughs> <laughs> we're making this one about four times a week in the summertime, and then maybe one of the other ones once a week. This one's cool because it's, um, it's made with local honey, with Wyoming honey. Um, Brian Honey and Worland, uh, they run bees all over the state. We go through probably 250 pounds of honey a week making Speed Goat. It's a, a real light, easy drinking beer. It's, uh, it's a kind of an easy transition into, into craft beer. Um, the next one is our Amber. It's more of a more malt forward. The hops are just there basically to balance out the, uh, the sweetness very malty. I like this one. Uh, the porter, now the, the porter's cool. The porter is cool because um, the water here is hard and so porters and hard water go together really, really well. And now kind of the cool thing here between these two and the differences in the, in the malt, this one gets about 40 pounds of the chocolate malt and that's where like a lot of the, the coffee or chocolate flavor comes from with this one. Also the really dark, dark color. This one has chocolate malt in it as well, but only about three pounds. There's tons of different barley out there, and even there's other malt outside of barley, like rye and wheat and oats and spelt. Um, typically, a majority of your beer is gonna be a base malt, either like a standard pale or pilsner malt. And then you add in just a little bit of um, specialty grains here and there to contribute whatever flavor you're going for. And it might not even be flavor, it might be like a mouthfeel or head retention type thing. Uh, let's see, this one would be our IPA. This is the one that we're, we struggle in the summer to keep up with this one. It takes us about three weeks to brew a batch from, from grain to glass, and it takes about three weeks, more or less, to drink a batch. <laughs> uh, the wheat beer we bring on during the summertime, uh, it's not a traditional wheat because we're using a, an ale yeast rather than a wheat, a wheat style yeast. And so it's not as hazy as some of the wheat beers might be. This is this one is really cool. This is the one that Alexa, it's an original recipe that Alexa came up with this summer. It's a, a hazy IPA called Mondo Biondo. It features just a 
ton of, of flaked wheat and malted oats. And it has three different types of hops from New Zealand, and I'm probably going to butcher their names, um, but Waiiti, Motir, and Kohatu. Um, the hop bill was just so we, we made astronomical <laughs> astronomical yeah so we'll, we'll measure it was funny because we'll make for the hops we'll measure these out to like the tenth of an ounce and we're really you know, well that's that's too much i'll pull one pellet out and put one pellet back in until i find the. this one was like five pounds yeah <laughs> seven pounds yeah, yeah. <laughs> the combination of the three of them is um just super flavorful juicy um specifically like lime and grapefruit zest, um, kind of stone fruit, so like peach and apricot a little bit. Um, and then it still has like some dank, um, like green tea and piney flavors to it as well. We didn't do anything to clarify that at all. It's a different yeast strain that I haven't used before. The proteins from the, uh, from the wheat are still in there. The, there's probably yeast still in there. So, um, and then a really creamy mouthfeel is kind of a big part of the style. Yeah, I mean, the more you experiment with different ingredients, the more you get to, the better you get to know those ingredients. Um, so yeah, there's all different types of malt and hops and yeast and um, not a lot of different types of water, but different types of treatment you can do to that water. Um, and all those things affect the flavor profile of your beer. So this one's, this one is actually a really cool beer. It's, um, boy, it's, it is Mondo hazy. Beyondo. Mondo Beyondo. Our, our yeah. first Ten Sleep Canyon named beer. So, I mean, there's always always something new to learn. I mean, this is something that people have been doing for 20,000 years or something like that in one form or another, and and the techniques have improved, but, I mean, there's still so much to learn. Wyoming is, is fiercely nativist, and, you know, if you're a Wyoming company, they will kick the door open for you, and then if you give them a product they like, they will hold that door open. And so we were pretty lucky to get in on the ground floor and we got out there with something they really liked and they've, thank goodness for them, even though it's, it's hard for them to get it sometimes, they've held the door open. Yeah. Everyone and their dog was having breweries, wineries, distilleries, but nobody was making mead. In Gillette, Big Lost blends community, history, and revelry with the toast of mead from a horn. A guy asked me, would you like to make mead? And I told him, no. It's a waste of time and it's way too expensive. And he's like, well, I got a guy, he'll sell you honey at a dirt cheap price if you try it. I'm like, all right. So I bought 125 pounds of honey off the guy, made a full barrel of mead, 59 gallons, and it took a whole year to make. We didn't know what we were doing. What seemed impractical became a calling and a business plan. Once it was done, it actually turned out pretty good. So I kind of quit making beer and wine, just started focusing on mead. With really having no idea what we're doing, we don't have this box that says, well, you should be doing this, you should be doing that, you shouldn't be doing this. We really didn't know. But we, yeah, we kind of stumbled into the process that we use now just by not knowing any better. Mead itself is an ancient brew Mead is, for what we know now, the oldest fermented beverage in the world. So it's got roots, and so a lot of people think, you know, mead like, you know, came from the Viking era. Well, mead actually has some distinct roots in various parts of the world. You know, ancient China, ancient Mesoamerica, ancient Mesopotamia, ancient Africa. That's one of the oldest types of mead that's still made. It's called Tej. It comes out of, like, the Ethiopia region. But every culture has their own word for it, and a lot of them are really, really old words. And mead has drastically not changed that much in the years since it started. The basis for mead is quite simple, but the spectrum of styles is broad. You ever seen 655 pounds of honey before? Yeah. So mead is fermented honey. And it can be made a bunch of different ways. It can be made like beer, it can be made like wine, it can be made like liquor, it can be made like something else which big loss, we would kind of fall in that something else category. We're kind of halfway between a wine and a liquor-ish. It can be mixed with grains, with fruits, with spices. And so like mellow mells would be fruit and honey. Sizers is a really old English word. That means apples and honey. Uh, methyl gin is another old English word. That means spices and honey. 
Most of the meads in the United States are made kind of that wine style is the majority of them. Usually a little bit sweeter, but yeah, very much a more light wine style. Whereas we're a little heavier, a little bolder. Then there's a whole session style, which is more of like your, uh, your ciders or your beers so that are carbonated, real low ABV. But mostly what people mean is honey, water, yeast. So when it comes to like the flavor profile of our meads, we specifically want to design something where it was blatantly obvious that it's honey and not wine. But to describe the flavor, we usually don't describe it to people because it's so different and we'd rather have people go in with blank palettes so that they don't have preconceived notions. So for instance, like at the bar, we serve out of horns. You know, part of that's the experiential side of it, but the other side of it is we found when you put it in a wine glass, well, people psychologically, if they think it's gonna be wine, they taste like, ooh, that is not wine at all. You put it in a glass where people don't know what to expect and they go in with an open mind like, oh, that's, that's actually pretty good. And the handling of flavors is a big part of the craft. We do a lot of like homebrew scale, five gallon test batches, or we'll do up to 60 gallon test batches. And so like here we have a peach mead that we're making for somebody's wedding. Here we have a radiant sun, which is an orange and honey. And then here we have a newborn widow, which is a lemon lavender. Then down here we have a cinnamon cranberry and we don't do any back sweetening. So all of our residual sugar is put on the fore end. So by the time it gets to the end, all the sugar is partially broken down. So there's fermenting the flavors themselves and going to the other side or fermenting your honey, making a base and adding flavors to it. We usually err on the side of putting everything on the front because every flavor complexity changes. So instead of just having pure orange on the other side, ferment the oranges, there's still that orange sensation, but it's not like biting into an orange dipped in honey. And it's weird because if you do it right, you can distinctly pick out flavors. And so like there is a meld, but like with the fresh bandito, I mean, you can taste the cucumber, you can taste the cilantro, you can taste the lime, and you can taste the jalapeno, and you can taste the honey distinctly on different parts of the palate. So being able to play the notes of the mead instead of just a single note. And then for our specialty batches, we've done, you know, our island gypsy is bananas and honey. We've done flathead warrior, which is flathead cherries and honey. The luscious gardener is peach blueberry basil. Um, we've done a black pepper vanilla. We've done boche, so caramelized honey. We've got one that's aging in a whiskey barrel with zero air fermentation. That's our demented grandpa. We've done ginger, lemons, lavender, and kind of all over the place. We're always playing with different things. The speed of the fermentation is key to complexity in brewing. So one of the biggest issues with mead is honey lacks a lot of nutrients that yeast needs to thrive. So your fruits, your grains, other sugars have a lot of these nutrients, and without that, yeast doesn't work, or it drastically slows down. So that's why like natural fermentation of honey maybe one or two years down the road till it gets all the way through its fermentation process. And so what they'll do is you add nutrient to it and it can either be you know, a chemical nutrient, it can be fruits, vegetables, it can be grain, it can be hard water, you know, different things like that will add that nutrient to help facilitate and expedite fermentation. Versus like, you know, uh, a grape, various fruits, grapes, grain, you know, fermentations, you know, anywhere from five days to maybe two or three weeks, versus honey can be years. As the mead market in America has doubled in the past five years, Big Lost has grown with it. We've seen a lot of growth in the last five years. So, you know, we were statewide distribution in Wyoming, North Dakota, South Dakota, Iowa. We have part of Kansas. We just opened up Taiwan. And then we're in the process of looking at some other countries and other states this coming year. It's allowing us some of the growth that we need to start pursuing more Wyoming grown honey. So we've already committed to putting 10,000 pounds of honey from Campbell County this next year versus taking everything out of Montana. One neat thing in Wyoming is, you know, we have 
all sorts of different breweries, wineries, distilleries, meateries, cideries, and all these things going on in Wyoming. And for the strong, strong majority, everybody works together really, really well. We had a gentleman from uh, Billings for six months, then Alexa this year, and you know, when I was in there, I kind of was, you know, head down, tail up, just trying to survive, but I didn't have time to think very much. And having Mike come in, and then Howard, and then Alexa, suddenly they're doing things on this system that, you know, probably took 40% of the time out of the day that it took me to do. and just this overall collaborative effort of developing local Wyoming product on not just a local, but also a national and international scale. And ultimately, one of the most satisfying parts for Orion and I started in Jackson when we were just knocking on doors. We're gleaning you know, the fruit, but we're also meeting those people. Each place we go, we meet a new slice of that community and get to know them and when they get to trust us and uh, then they see their apples go to good use when they hadn't in the past. I think it's a really great way to connect with people. You know, Rising Tide floats all ships. Our goal is to get people to consume local. And it's, it's kind of bipartisan and it's kind of across the board. Everyone can get behind taking advantage of a harvest when it's available. We actively promote each other's products. This is our playground. This episode of Farm to Fork Wyoming is available. Order online at shop.wyomingpbs.org. This program was produced by Wyoming PBS, which is solely responsible for its content. To learn more and watch Wyoming PBS programs online, visit us at wyomingpbs.org.